Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, highlights from this year's Service Members of the Year Gala. Hear from this year's recipients at the annual event in Washington. Plus, how the U.S. Army tests the effects of fighting in high altitude on troops using specialized gear. Go with us inside the hyperbaric chamber. And what happened when Special Forces troops got their hands on a bunch of unmanned robotic vehicles for testing? Find out in this week's Miltech. Also, which defense company closed a deal to upgrade U.S. strikers' electronic warfare suites? We have the details. And while the Army eyes allowing beer and barracks, the Navy considers a pilot program for offering vegan meat. See what's on the menu near you. Finally, want to watch the Navy sink one of its own ships? We'll bring you the video. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Marjorie Sensor, filling in for Andrea Scott. When it comes to preparing troops to fight anywhere in the world, the Army is always looking for an edge. One of its more problematic battlefields, high altitude environments. To test a variety of gear and the impacts on soldiers of operating in low oxygen environments, researchers at the Soldier System Center in Natick, Massachusetts, use an intimidating structure called a hyperbaric chamber. In our next episode of the Future Soldier series, we take a look inside. Check it out. Soldiers have fought in high altitudes and battles in Europe during World War II and also as recently in Afghanistan. Looking over the horizon, the Pentagon is preparing for potential conflicts with China and North Korea where these high altitude fights may come into play. The U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, otherwise known as Eucerium, has Pikes Peak Lab in Colorado as well as other locations to study how soldiers deal with altitude. They also have a controlled hypobaric chamber tucked away in Natick, Massachusetts, where Military Times editor Sarah Sicard and I recently visited. So can you tell me a little bit about where we're standing right now? Definitely. Uh, we are in U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine's uh, hypobaric chamber that's located in Natick, Massachusetts. Can you tell me a little bit about what a hypobaric chamber is and what it does? Yeah, definitely. So a hypobaric chamber um, in its most simplest form is actually like a really large vacuum and so you actually suck out the air and this reduces the amount of pressure and essentially we're, we're simulating um, the lower pressure that somebody would experience when they go to high altitude. So when a soldier goes to high mountainous, high altitude mountainous terrain, um, they can, there's various different impacts on their, their health and readiness. And so the first is acute mountain sickness. Um, depending on elevation, um, th this can be very, very moderate to very severe headache, nausea, vomiting, and if severe, they could actually be medevac. The second is the impact of altitude on physical performance. If you imagine that somebody can run, or a warfighter can run ten, a 10 minute mile at sea level, now if they went to 14,000 feet, um, there would be a 45% decrement in performance. And so imagine now, it's taking 14 and a half minutes. Uh, you know, really can impact the ability for the warfighter to complete the mission and task. How do you guys sort of monitor uh, when you have people in the chamber? How do you monitor their health, their progress, um, and ensure that you know everything is done safely? Yeah, great question. Uh, the the chamber is separated by into uh, two research chambers: the small small chamber on the left hand side, uh, the large chamber on the right hand side, and what we call the antechamber airlock on in the middle. Okay, and so the now, when we, when we conduct studies, um, the, the crew chief will sit here and then we actually have uh, two other um, individuals helping to operate the large and small chamber. All the time there's somebody on station watching the volunteers. And then we also have cameras, they're not on right now, but we also have cameras that are inside the large and small chamber in which we're constantly monitoring the volunteers. One of our big focuses on is uh, exercise capabilities. And so we actually measure you know, oxygen consumption, breathing, other different um, the other variables that are of interest to us. 
in the hypobaric chamber with regards to research, we, can, we also have the capabilities to collect blood samples, do various different types of testing in, in the chamber. In the last five years, we've been looking at prediction algorithms. So what that is, is we want to predict in real time which soldiers are most likely to get acute mountain sickness before they get it. And so that way we can prevent casualties uh, before they occur. So there's a huge individual susceptibility to who gets sick and who does not. And that was the main purpose of this study, is to look at physiologic and genomic predictors of uh, being able to identify those individuals. One study that was done in the Taos Ski Valley in New Mexico asked the question, who gets sicker? Soldiers who rug up a mountain or soldiers who make it up by vehicle? So some rucked up for about two hours. And we actually have analyzed that data and we have found that active ascent accelerates the time course of acute mountain sickness. So normally acute mountain sickness peaks within the first 20 hours after you get to altitude, after the first night of sleep. We found that when you actively ascended and exercised, it, it disrupted your fluid volume. And then in the first night, they were, they were the sickest. So we did find some differences in some variables between active and passive ascent, but not in all of the variables. We're also looking at the genomic profile of these soldiers. DNA, everybody has it, it's from birth, it does not change, but RNA, um, that can be upregulated or downregulated in people differently depending on um, what environment they're exposed to. So one of the things that we're really trying to look at besides physiologic monitoring is to improve the accuracy of these algorithms by getting a prior risk level on each of these um, volunteers, which is more like personalized medicine, so that we can then predict with more accuracy who is likely to get sick. So the Army scientists have collected a lot of data in the field and in the hyperbaric chamber. But how will army squads use this? The researchers are turning to at-home pregnancy tests for inspiration. So we want to develop something that either they can spit into or they can pee on. So we want it to be very simplified. So similar to COVID where you get the screening test for that, we want to have a screening test on a stick they can either um, spit in, pee on, that will give them, yes, you're high risk, medium risk, low risk. And in other news from around the military, want some vegan meat to go with that near beer? The Navy might be required to serve vegan meats or plant-based protein options at some forward bases if a measure in the 2023 defense bill gets passed. Tucked into the proposed Pentagon budget is a pilot program for the food option to be tested at at least two installations, prioritizing areas where traditional meats are expensive to obtain. The program would run for three years, according to the plan, and the Army may be considering allowing troops to have beer in the barracks. Time for that unit level kegger? Maybe not quite, but when asked whether troops should be allowed to have unlimited Miller lights in their fridges and barracks housing, the Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston, didn't say no. Currently, policies on the matter differ for various units and individual commands, but maybe an Army-wide change is coming, we'll keep an eye on it. Over in the Navy, for the first time in its long history, the Navy's Blue Angels demonstration team will have a female pilot. Women have served with the Blue Angels in other capacities for more than 55 years, but Lieutenant Amanda Lee of Mound View, Minnesota, is the first to join the iconic flight squadron as a demonstration pilot. Lee is currently serving as a pilot in Strike Fighter Squadron 106, known as the Gladiators, another demonstration team. Finally, this is our first chance to bring you images of two stories that took place while we were out last week to host the Service Members of the Year Award. First, what does it look like when the Navy sinks one of its own ships? The seagoing force released video of this year's Sink X, or Sink Exercise, as part of a multinational training event in the Pacific. Towed out for a final mission was the decommissioned guided missile frigate Rodney M. Davis, which was retired after 28 years of service. The Navy regularly performs a SYNC-X to practice live fire missions on surface vessels. And back in Washington, World War II hero and Medal of Honor recipient Herschel Woody Williams was given a final salute at the U.S. Capitol recently. 
a hero of the Iwo Jima beach landings where he used a flamethrower to knock out enemy positions, Williams died in June at the age of 98. I was lucky enough to meet Woody and share a stage with his mission to honor and support Gold Star families, unveiled a special memorial in Owensboro, Kentucky. By that point, he'd been giving back to his beloved country and those who defended it for 77 years. So needless to say, Woody's service leaves us a rich legacy. Five, six, he was never the tallest Marine at 135 pounds, never the biggest, yet he was a force of nature on the battlefield. At Iwo Jima, Woody marched through a hailstorm of gunfire, single-handedly destroying seven enemy positions. Williams, a retired Marine, was the last living Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. When we come back, Special Forces troops teaming up with robotic vehicles, find out what happened when they went out into the testing grounds together. Welcome back. The U.S. Army has been making strides in unmanned and robotic-controlled vehicles for a while. But to really start putting them to the test, Special Forces soldiers recently got their hands on some of them to evaluate how troops would fight alongside their robotic allies. Military Times' Todd South takes a look at what they learned in this week's Miltech. How will soldiers fight with robotic-controlled vehicles? Some Green Berets with the 1st Special Forces Group recently spent two weeks in Utah buzzing around the desert with unmanned vehicles to figure that out. The field operation, or robot dune buggy race maybe, is part of an effort called Project Origin. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command engineers at the Ground Vehicle Systems Center worked alongside these bearded bad boys to collect data on this emerging technology. The soldiers learned basic vehicle handling and ran standard mission training packages, including multiple day and night live fires. Those live fires included an M240 machine gun, the Ma Deuce 50 Cal, and my personal favorite, the Mark 19 grenade launcher. The Green Berets worked both offensive and defensive maneuvers, so think about like convoy operations, patrols, and ambushes. They also had to run long-range reconnaissance movements and practice concealment with unmanned vehicles. Electronic warfare and autonomous resupply missions were also on the menu for those operators. The soldiers were fitting unmanned vehicles with soldier-driven vehicles and dismounted troops. The ultimate goal is to have robot vehicles run as a kind of a reliable battle buddy in combat. So data scientists gather information from this soldier experiment for the Army's Robotic Technology Kernel, or RTK. The RTK information feeds into a library of software that can eventually be pulled from to teach robotic vehicles how to operate with humans near instantaneously, rather than having to redrive, retrain these future systems on how to maneuver. All that data comes through to the soldier in the Warfighter Machine Interface. Army's library of software being used to control robotic vehicles. But you don't have to be special forces to play with robot vehicles. Regular old soldiers and Marines have been part of the Army's Small Multipurpose Equipment Transport, or SMET, program. That's a kind of a robotic mule that basically runs autonomously alongside dismounted troops, but also can be operated by a driver. The SMETs carry gear and supplies, food, water, ammo, and medicine, to take that load off the dismounted soldier. Back in October, the Army put Project Origin vehicles in the rotation at the Joint Readiness Training Center at Fort Polk, Louisiana. That exercise took two of the vehicles and paired them with soldiers from the 1st Battalion, 509th Infantry, and the 3rd of the 101st Airborne Division in a simulated battle with each other. And wouldn't you know it, a tropical storm pounded the soldiers in the midst of the exercise. But hey, if it ain't raining, you ain't, well, nah, never, I'm not gonna say that, it's old school. Soldiers at JRTC used their robot to block an intersection for 36 hours. The vehicle's low heat signature and battery-powered silent watch system helped out quite a bit. The 509 soldiers also used the robot to block helicopter landing zones and run route reconnaissance, taking another type of load off of the soaking wet soldiers. Or as one expert said, if we assign them the dur dumb, dirty, dangerous missions to robots, we can reassign our soldiers to the high-priority complex missions and tasks that they really need to do in the field. Or maybe they can just take a nap, I don't know, just a suggestion. Now back in 2022 in Utah with the Green Berets. Those Green Berets said that a key feature of using the unmanned vehicles allowed for a better standoff, which really gives them a better chance to recognize and identify individuals, targets, or threats from a distance, and that also decreases the risk to the soldier. One senior weapons sergeant said that it allows troops to focus on terrain analysis and think ahead instead of running up on an enemy and having to seek cover or return fire immediately. I think I agree. I'd rather send a robot out to check out a target than show up for a lead-filled greeting. We'll keep track of all your military robot needs here at Military Times. This has been Todd South. 
And now for the latest updates in defense industry news, here's this week's Defense Dollars. The U.S. Army wants a next-generation platform on the Striker to beat out the highest of enemy technology. The service awarded an Other Transaction Authority Agreement to furnish prototypes for the Terrestrial Layer System Brigade Combat Team Program, meant to give soldiers a relevant suite of electronic warfare, cyber, and signals intelligence capabilities. The Army announced the agreement last week, and it runs through October 2023. Lockheed Martin will provide prototypes mounted into Stryker combat vehicles ready for operational assessment and issuance to an initial unit. An Army official told Defense News that TLS BCT is an integrated suite of signals intelligence, electronic warfare, and cyberspace operations that detects, locates, and disrupts enemy signals. The Maryland-based defense contractor in September won a $9.6 million second round contract, beating out Boeing subsidiary Digital Receiver Technology and allowing it to continue development. We're gonna need a bigger boat. That's the U.S. Coast Guard's plan to counter China and Russia's activity in the Arctic. Polar ice has steadily decreased over the last few decades, opening potential new trade routes that could link Asia, North America, and Europe. During a hearing with the House Homeland Security Committee's Transportation and Maritime Security Panel, Admiral Linda Fagan emphasized the need to build an icebreaker fleet capable of maintaining a strong presence in the Arctic region, specifically pointing to polar security cutters. Production for the first polar security cutter began this year. Shipbuilder VT Halter Maritime is manufacturing the first PSC under a fixed price contract, expected to conclude in 2025. The Coast Guard will eventually receive three heavy icebreakers, followed by three medium icebreakers. The Coast Guard requested $167.2 million in the fiscal 2023 budget to continue production of the PSCs, while also seeking $30.1 million to operate a commercially available icebreaker while it waits. The United States is sending Ukraine up to $400 million in additional military equipment and supplies. The shipment includes four more medium-range rocket systems and ammunition as the embattled nation tries to repel Russia's advances in the Donbass region. The four additional M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket Systems, or HIMARS, will bring the total number sent to Ukraine to a dozen. That's according to a senior defense official who added that the first eight HIMARS were particularly useful for Ukraine as the fight in the Donbass has largely evolved into an artillery duel. The official refuted Russian reports that two of the delivered HIMARS were destroyed and said all eight are accounted for and still in use by Ukraine. The military equipment being drawn down from U.S. stockpiles and sent to Ukraine also includes three tactical vehicles, demolition munitions, counter battery systems, and spare parts. When we come back, the latest tips from our financial expert and later highlights from the annual Service Members of the Year Gala. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives her latest tips. Traveling is always an adventure, whether it's for business or pleasure. Making sure you come back with great memories depends on more than just taking great pics. You've got to keep your wits about you and take precautionary measures. If you're planning on an excursion, don't sign or pay anything until you've read all the terms of the deal and request a copy of refund policies. If they can't provide one, then walk away. Also, do your homework. Look up all the travel companies, hotels, and rentals you plan to use and read the reviews. See something funny? Don't book it. Or at the very least, call the company for more details. And before you head out, call your bank or credit union and credit card companies and let them know when and where you'll be traveling. Otherwise, you might get declined when shopping abroad. You could even ask that they put a hold on any cards you're not taking with you just to be safe, which you can never be too much of when it comes to traveling. So take these steps to make every trip a pleasure trip. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more of our coverage, be sure to check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com and DefenseNews.com. And to get a list of our top stories in your inbox every weekday, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, we hear from the 2022 Service Members of the Year and get a look at this year's big event.
Welcome back. The annual Service Members of the Year Awards in Washington is always a big event honoring selflessness and heroism among military members and veterans. And this year was no different. Held at the Ronald Reagan Building in the nation's capital, this year featured heroic rescues and courage under fire. Here are some of the highlights. I think of my time in Special Forces as a young detachment commander, where I bore witness to acts of heroism, gallantry, and valor that only the crucibles of combat can expose. The annual Service Members of the Year ceremony is a celebration of those who go an extra measure to distinguish themselves in uniform. Each year, awards are given to standouts from each branch and the Coast Guard, plus a veteran who is making an impact in their community. Held in the heart of Washington, D.C., the awards dinner featured remarks from a range of service chiefs and members of Congress who lauded the actions of the 2022 winners. Our service members do hold a very, very special place in my heart. You all have chosen to defend your country and fight for the values and the ideals that we all cherish here in the United States, and for that, you have our eternal thanks. Service members were nominated this year for a range of acts of heroism, including saving fellow troops in combat and performing daring rescues at sea. From the Navy, helicopter air crewman AWS-1 Cale Foy was honored for helping rescue victims of a boat accident. I love my job. Good evening, I just want to say a couple thanks to my wife, Min. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me. I thank the lucky stars every single day. Yeah. It's hard for spouses these days to get the recognition. She needs it. Through all the deployments and everything we've gone together, thank you so much for being there for me and our family. And my last thanks, I wish I could raise a toast, but keep in memory of those who are standing the watch right now and allowing us to have this fun evening with friends, family, so others may live. In the Army, Major Nicholas Dockery was recognized for heroics in combat in Afghanistan, where the Green Beret helped save the lives of fellow soldiers in an intense firefight. Without a doubt, Nick epitomizes the Army values of leadership. He was repeatedly demonstrated loyalty to his Special Forces teammates, the Army and the nation. His dedication to duty is undeniable. I'm forever thankful to these NCOs that supported me and believed in our team. Teammates who uniquely understood the importance of defending democracy, no matter the cost. And if we ever need a reminder of this, we need look no further than the white gravestones lying in Arlington, just down the road. Airman of the Year Staff Sergeant Duncan Copley was nominated for his work in helping evacuate Afghan civilians from the Kabul airport even under the threat of a bomb attack on his aircraft. To find yourself in a situation where it goes from order to chaos, and you look around and there's desperation in the eyes of some of those passengers who wanted nothing else but to get on that airplane and get out to freedom. And then you had to make this tough call, a choice without any clear answers, just tough, difficult choices with people looking at you for answers. You had to be the calm in the midst of that chaos. You had to be the confidence in the midst of that desperation. Operations Allied Refuge was a team event. And I couldn't be here without everyone else who put forth their work, determination, and skills to make it possible. <clears throat> I would like to thank my parents, Patty and Dave, my little sister Abigail, and my girlfriend Macy for always being there when I need them. I'm not much of a public speaker, so that's really all I got. Thank you, guys. <laughs> for profiles of all of this year's winners and stories of the actions that got them nominated, view our full coverage at servicemembersoftheyear.org and militarytimes.com. For Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. That's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.